modified monkeys? Is that what we are? Is that what we are? Or is it just a mask some scientists want us to wear? Us to wear? The origin of life community has not been honest. Not Materialists understand that materialism cannot explain the mind. Who am I? Rather than abandoning materialism, they abandon the mind. Our planet has water and carbon water both necessary for life. So the Earth is exceedingly rare. You get many people deceived, thinking that life has been all but made. We come from the way. There exists a code so complex and advanced that it defies the probability of chance. When we see information in software and we trace that information back to its source, we always come to a mind that's part of what we know from our observation of the world around us, that information always arises from an intelligent source. Everything, if Darwin is right, is mechanical and blind and purposeless at the bottom. Our planet is a lonely speck in the great enveloping cosmic dark. The cosmos is all it is, or ever was, or ever will be. The cosmos is all it is, is all it is. Mechanical and blind and purposeless, purposeless at the bottom. The cosmos is all it is, is all it is. How do they know the cosmos is all there is? Isn't our reality more than just matter? Most people and cultures around the world have a profound belief that life extends beyond the physical. That compassion, ideas, joy, and sorrow aren't made of matter, but are as real to us as our arms and legs. If we believe this, are we anti-science? Or is it materialism that is anti-science? Let's see what Dr. Jay Richards, an expert on modern materialism, has to say. Hi, nice to meet you. Materialism is really a philosophy about reality. It's just the idea that matter or matter and natural laws are the fundamental reality. So really the only thing exists is blind matter in motion and everything else is explained in terms of matter. matter. This is the view of reality we are constantly bombarded with in our culture. And I have a materialist view of the world, and so that commits me to the view that uh, when I think I have free will, when I think that I'm exercising free, free choice, I'm deluding myself, deluding myself. Wait, what? No free will? So, if all of our choices are delusions, then how can we be responsible for our actions? That's nonsense. Our choices are real, and we are responsible for our actions. It's how we stay civilized. In fact, the most important part of being human is immaterial. Love isn't just real, it's the most valued aspect of humanity. Even more than science, it is our consciousness, our sense of self, that gives us the ability to love. But what do materialists say? Uh, the self is an illusion. The sense of being an ego, an I, a thinker of thoughts. Now that sense of being a subject, a locus of consciousness inside the head, is an illusion, is an illusion. For the materialist, things like your thought or your existence or your purposes, uh, they're just epiphenomena or sort of froth. So, to a materialist, our subjective thoughts are not real. But our thoughts and beliefs have real consequences. The thing that we all know most directly and most certainly, that is the existence of ourselves, is ultimately incompatible with materialism. Well, my argument would be, look, any philosophical view that entails you don't exist is a view that you really ought not to entertain. Frustrating is that in the modern age, 
people often try to identify this philosophical idea of materialism with the practice of natural science itself. Uh, but there's no reason these two things would go together. Natural science is just a formal way to discover truths about nature. So how does science discover the truth about nature? Test ideas by experiment and observation. Build on those ideas that pass the test. Reject the ones that fail. Follow the evidence wherever it leads and question everything. Question everything. Well, who's doing that? Who's doing it? Who's setting up these experiments? What is an experiment? What is an observation? Uh, what constitutes evidence? Oddly, the scientific materialist has to deny the existence of scientists. The self is an illusion. Well, what is not an illusion is the bigotry and intolerance of the scientific community. I want to put on the table not why 85% of the National Academy rejects God. I want to know why 15% don't. Any view that challenges materialism is punished. It's this materialist dogma that keeps many scientists behind a mask. But some scientists are willing to speak up about where the evidence leads. I, I was brought up with materialist viewpoints uh, all the way through high school and college and medical school. You, you get inundated with um, scientific viewpoints that have a materialist bias. The cosmos is all that is, all that is. And it's all just mechanical and blind and purposeless, purposeless at the bottom. The deeper I looked into the science, the more I realized what a catastrophe for science uh, materialism and atheism really is. Science delusion is the belief that science already understands the nature of reality in principle, leaving only the details to be filled in. It's the kind of belief system of people who say, I don't believe in God, I believe in science. Materialism is not science. It's simply a worldview that fails to explain or even consider the most profound, interesting and beautiful aspects of human reality. Materialists are free to preach their religion, but they should stop pretending it's science. We want to follow the evidence, wherever it leads, and decide for ourselves. We are not materialists. We see the human soul. We experience love. We live with purpose. We fight for justice. We are the quiet majority, and we will be quiet no longer. of mental life, of intelligence, of categorization, of language, uh, of planning, of emotion, could arise from the uh, structure of this uh, three pounds of uh, flesh. Your robot's made out of meat, which is what I'm going to try to convince you of today. Robot's made out of meat. Are you and I really robots? What you are, what I am, is a hundred trillion little cellular robots. Robots. That may sound scientific, but is it? I spoke with Dr. Michael Egnor, a human brain expert. An eliminative materialism is an ideological viewpoint, a philosophical viewpoint, but it's not a scientific viewpoint. It is the viewpoint that there is no such thing as the mind. It's not that the mind is explainable by matter, it's just that the mind doesn't exist at all. It exists at all. The one thing almost everyone accepts is that we actually exist. We're persons, not just a collection of body parts. We have a self, an inescapable I. I have a brain, but I am not a brain. I feel emotions, but I am not an emotion. I think thoughts, but I am not a thought. Who are you? Think about it. 
Who am I? Who am I? Most people feel they're more than their physical bodies. What materialists don't tell you is this feeling is actually supported by science. Recent research has revealed fresh evidence for an immaterial mind, where thoughts actually change your brain. Dr. Jeffrey Schwartz treats people who suffer from obsessive compulsive disorder. His treatments provide evidence that thoughts can change our physical brains. By training people, literally training them to reinterpret the feelings that you need to check or that something is dirty, reinterpret it as a false message from your brain. People could in fact learn how to understand that this is not me, this is a false message from my brain, and when they did that, their OCD improved and their brain changed. That's the part where you really get the leverage to say you're not just your brain because choices you make can actually change how your brain works. This research clearly supports mind over matter. Mind, mind over, over matter. matter. Further evidence for an immaterial mind comes from an operation known as a corpus callosotomy. In this operation, you literally cut the brain in half by severing the corpus callosum this operation that I've performed, and their brains were essentially cut in half. But they still seem to be a unitary person. They still seem to be fairly normal. And what that implies is that the human mind is not purely uh, generated by the matter of the brain. Otherwise, cutting the brain in half would have profound effects on the human mind. It might make two people. Certainly, it would, it would create a, a rather profound difference in a person's state of consciousness. And it doesn't. A third piece of evidence for an immaterial mind comes from brain stimulation experiments that seem to show our intellect and identity are not found in our brain tissue. Some of the most famous of these experiments were conducted by brain surgeon Wilder Penfield. He was a meticulous scientist. He repeatedly observed that there were aspects of the patient's mind that no matter what he did to the brain, he couldn't affect. You know, he, could, he could elicit memories by stimulating a part of the brain. He could make a muscle move or make a patient have a sensation. But he couldn't change uh, their consciousness. He couldn't change their intellect. He couldn't change their sense of self. That no matter what he did to the brain, remained the same. A fourth piece of evidence for an immaterial mind comes from experiments about free will. Materialists try to convince us that free will does not exist. I hope to convince you that free will is an illusion. Free, free will is an illusion. But Dr. Benjamin Leibitz's experiments show that humans do have free will. At least the free will to say no. About perhaps half a second before you decide to do something, there's a spike in your brain that he called the readiness potential. It's almost like an unconscious mode. Materialists have used this readiness potential to suggest that we are misled into thinking we have free will. Free, free will is an illusion. That our material brain just sort of makes the decision. And we kind of think that we decided. But we didn't. Leibitt didn't agree with that. He asked the subjects to do something more. He said, when you decide to do something, then decide not to. When they did that, he found that there was a readiness potential for deciding to push the button. But there wasn't a readiness potential to decide not to push it. And he said, he didn't prove the existence of free will, but he proved the existence of free won't. And that's what he called it, free won't. That in a sense, we have motives that are beyond our control. We can't stop the motives, but we can stop ourselves from doing it. Materialist scientists mostly ignore this evidence because it doesn't support their worldview. You are cellular ro ro robots. Materialists are realists in a sense. They understand that materialism cannot explain the mind. Rather than abandoning materialism, they abandon the mind, which uh, I think is a mistake. Neuroscience shows that you are more than your brain. This liberating evidence frees us to think rationally about who we really are, body, soul, and mind. 
We are not materialists. We see the human soul. We experience love. We live with purpose. We fight for justice. We are the quiet majority, and we will be quiet no longer. shown that DNA is actually the software of life. It's totally interchangeable between the digital world and the biological world. The DNA code itself is so digital, is so almost exactly like uh, a computer tape. Totally interchangeable. The DNA code itself is the software of life. So digital. Scientists have come to the amazing conclusion that our bodies contain digital code. digital code. In fact, Bill Gates, you know, the founder of Microsoft, tweeted, DNA is more advanced than any software ever created. Ever created. Ever created. Think about it. A program or code is written by someone very smart. The more complex the code, the more intelligent the author has to be. So here's the question. If our DNA code is more complex than any man-made software, where did it come from? Is it possible it was authored without an author, author without programmed without a program? Programmed without a program. Materialists think so, through neo-Darwinism, the modern version of Darwinian evolution. Stephen Meyer, author of the New York Times bestseller, Darwin's Doubt, explains. According to neo-Darwinism, new genetic information arises as a result of random mutations in the arrangement of the nucleotide bases along the spine of the DNA molecule. If those random changes are beneficial, they're passed on and preserved, and if many such changes are preserved and passed on, they would accumulate over time and eventually result in a very significant change in the morphology, the form of the organism. That's like saying if this game had glitches every time it was copied online, and gamers shared their favorite mutated versions and trashed the rest, it would eventually turn into this. Come on, really? If we know the computer glitches won't produce a new video game, how much sense does it make to believe that glitches, copying errors, and our DNA code can produce new organisms? Could random mutations in DNA really produce this? 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 What about this? This, 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 or this. Everything we know about software shows that random changes in a section of functional code or functional information is going to degrade that information long before you ever get to something fundamentally new. And that's the problem with the mutation selection mechanism as an explanation for new genetic information. Information in DNA is also essentially typographic or digital. And there are far more ways to go wrong in arranging those characters than there are ways to go right. And so as you begin to randomly change them, you inevitably fall into a non-functional abyss long before you ever generate anything fundamentally new. So just how unlikely is it for random genetic changes to produce something new, even something as modest as a protein structure with a new function? One scientist performed experiments that enabled him to actually calculate the odds, and they aren't good. In fact, they're next to impossible. We caught up with a molecular biologist, Douglas Axe, in Seattle. In our lab work, we, we've asked how rare or how common functional proteins are within the space of possibilities. Doing experiments and calculations, we found that they're exceedingly rare, like one in 10 to the 74th power rare. To get a feel for those odds, imagine that somebody hid one atom somewhere within the Milky Way galaxy, and you, blindfolded by chance, are supposed to pick one atom and hope that it's the right one. Those odds would be better than the odds for the protein. Axe calculated the probability for all the chance mutations in all of the life forms on Earth for billions of years. And in all that time, he found they couldn't chance on even one new functional protein structure. Not one, zero. And keep in mind, it takes thousands of distinct proteins to build any kind of complex life, including humans. 
and many of these proteins are unique to each individual life form. So we go from improbable to basically impossible. The bottom line is that the mutation selection mechanism simply lacks the creative power to generate the new information necessary to build new organisms in the history of life. If the material processes of mutation and natural selection aren't capable of producing the biological information needed for life, then where did it come from? Our uniform and repeated experience, as Darwin himself pointed out, is the basis of all scientific reasoning about the past. So when we see information in a digital form in software, or we see a paragraph in a book, and we trace that information back to its source, we always come to a mind, not a material process. That's part of what we know from our observation of the world around us, that information always arises from an intelligent source. So we can apply that knowledge to the question of historical biology. And when we see that information is the foundation of life, we can infer that the best explanation for the origin of that information is in fact also a mind, a conscious agent, not an undirected material process. When presented with evidence that conflicts with neo-Darwinism, most scientists cling to a belief in the blind process of evolution, denying what science has discovered that at the foundation of life, there exists a code so complex and advanced that it defies chance. They make no room for the possibility that we were created by an intelligence far more sophisticated than the most genius of programmers. Instead, they choose to limit their investigation to a strictly materialist worldview. When faced with this evidence, how will you respond? We are not materialists. We see the human soul. We experience love. We, we live, live with, with purpose. purpose. We fight for justice. We are the quiet majority, and we will be quiet no longer. If you were designing a universe for life, I suspect you might design it differently. There is no evidence of design or purpose to our universe. I'm a speck on a speck orbiting a speck among still other specks in the middle of specklessness. I am not, I am insignificant, I suck. No design, no purpose. I'm Are we really just insignificant specks in an accidental universe? Do we really just suck? I suck. <laughs> Those are some dramatic claims, but not everyone thinks that way. In fact, some very distinguished scientists disagree. Freeman Dyson, a world-renowned physicist and mathematician says, and I quote, the more I examine the universe and study the details of its architecture, the more evidence I find that the universe in some sense must have known that we were coming. So maybe it's not an accident that Earth is habitable. We caught up with physicist Bijan Namadi, who was a senior engineer at NASA's Jet Propulsion Lab for over 16 years. What we've discovered in the last few decades is that the properties of the universe in general and our planet in particular are fine-tuned, not just for our survival, but actually for our, our thriving, our benefit. So Earth is not just habitable, it's better than that. It's hospitable. It's like this. Imagine you're a space explorer and you land on a distant planet. There's no water, no oxygen, and it's 300 degrees below zero. You're screwed. But then off in the distance, you see a structure. And the closer you get, the more it looks like a house. When you open the door, you find it's been filled with warm, breathable air. You take off your spacesuit and find a faucet with drinkable water and a refrigerator stocked with healthy and delicious food. What's your first thought? The house and everything in it was the product of a mindless natural process? Or that it was designed to take care of you, to meet your needs? and that someone prepared it as a home for human beings, like you. Our planet, Earth, is that home.
Our planet is a terrestrial planet. It has water and carbon, both necessary for life. It has an oxygen, nitrogen atmosphere in just the right proportion for life to thrive. We have plate tectonics to circulate minerals. We have a magnetosphere that protects us from harmful radiation. Our moon stabilizes our axial tilt, giving us a stable climate. And we have gas giant planets, particularly Jupiter, cleaning up the solar system from comets and asteroids that could harm us. And we are located in the habitable zone of a very stable energetic star, which itself is located in the habitable zone of a metal-rich mature galaxy. So the Earth is apparently exceedingly rare. There is no design or purpose to our universe. Still stuck on that? Even though the Earth meets exactly the conditions needed to sustain life? Well, what about our universe and the precise settings of its physical laws that keep things in order? What they call fine-tuning? Cosmological physicist Frank Tipler explains. Fine-tuning in physics refers to the fact, the observed fact, that were we to modify the constants of nature just slightly, life would never appear in this universe. Imagine you have a universe app where you can mess with the universal laws of physics from the beginning of time. Starting with gravity, too strong and the stars would be unstable and deadly to life. Too weak and the stars would struggle to create carbon and oxygen. Again, no life. We got Stephen Meyer, who holds a PhD from Cambridge, to break it down. The force of gravity is not too strong, not too weak, the speed of light, not too fast, not too slow. The ratios of these fundamental forces are delicately balanced. It's the just right universe that makes life possible. So it's got to be exact. But materialists say we just got lucky with gravity. Now, let's set our universe app to random and tap the button. What are the chances that the app will luck onto a gravity setting that just happens to allow life to emerge? Scientists have crunched the numbers, and the answer? Not good. You mean not good like one out of a hundred? I'd say one out of a million. Actually, for gravity, it's worse. Worse than one chance in a billion, times a trillion, times a trillion. So you're telling me there's a chance. Yeah! Yeah! We all love rooting for long shots, but here's the thing. It's not just gravity. There are many other physical laws that also have to be just so for life to emerge in the universe. And some of them are even more fine-tuned, even more unlikely than gravity. Without fine-tuning, our universe would be a horror story even Stephen King couldn't imagine. The very construction of the world and the fact that we seem to be the only blue-populated planet in the universe it makes you have to believe that if we happen by accident, it would make winning the lottery look like flipping a coin. So I have a tendency to believe in intelligent design. Nobel Prize winning physicist Charles Towns seemed to agree by stating, and I quote, intelligent design, as one sees it from a scientific point of view, seems to be quite real. This is a very special universe. It's remarkable that it came out just this way. But of course, materialist scientists claim they have a better answer. There's an ob obvious and e easy naturalistic explanation in the form of the cosmological multiverse. The multiverse acknowledges that the conditions necessary to make life in this universe are incredibly improbable. But it posits the existence of multiple billions of other universes, and we just happen to be in that lucky universe. Keep in mind that there's no evidence that these other universes actually exist. There are no experimentally tested laws of physics telling us that these other universes exist. No evidence for leprechauns, no evidence for unicorns, no evidence for the existence of other universes with different values of these fundamental constants. And there's still another problem with the multiverse explanation. The new mechanisms that have been proposed as possible ways of generating new universes themselves require fine-tuning. So in order to explain the fine-tuning, you have to posit prior universe-generating mechanisms that themselves require fine-tuning. And so in the end, you're left right where you started. Right where you started. The many aspects of nature that have been fine-tuned for life are overwhelming. All of this evidence shows you are not insignificant. 
you are not an accident. And you don't suck. Someone had you in mind. Someone had us all in mind. We are not materialists. We see the human soul. We experience love. We live with purpose. We fight for justice. We are the quiet majority, and we will be quiet no longer. on earth must have spontaneously generated itself. Scientists have reason to think that the first living cells on earth came about through a natural process called chemical evolution. The first living cells on chemical evolution. Did life really spontaneously generate itself from chemicals? Has science shown this? We tracked down James Tour, one of the world's leading experts in synthetic organic chemistry, to find out. All of these little pictures of molecules coming together to form the first cell are fallacious, are ridiculous. The origin of life community has not been honest. They will write in their very papers, they will see some small phenomena and extrapolate what this means in the context of origin of life. And then they will work with the press, and the press will extrapolate it all the more. And you get many, many people deceived, thinking that life has been all but made. All of this is, all a, of lie. This is a lie. Science. Scientist Craig Venter creates life for the first time in a laboratory. We're here today to announce uh, the first uh, synthetic cell. We haven't, we haven't created life nowhere close. What they did is they took a cell. They took the genome out of that cell. They manufactured a genome that's similar to it and they put it in. That is akin to taking an engine out of a Ford and putting it in to a Buick and then saying, look, I created automobiles. No, you just took one piece and it's not even the engine. It's just the computer control box you took out of one car and you put it in another car. That's what it was like. But the design of the computer control box you got from other cells. Other scientists say they've been able to create protocells in the lab that are the stepping stones to the first life. I can mix some chemicals together in a test tube in my lab. And these, these chemicals will start to self-associate to form larger and larger structures. The protocell moves. As a metabolism, it could use energy and it moves around. Protocells are a bunch of nonsense. That is like a proto-turkey. I take 20 pounds of sliced turkey meat from a delicatessen. I throw that into a pot. I add some turkey broth. I warm that up and I throw in some feathers and I say, that's a proto-turkey. Yeah, there's no order to it, but you know, if you wait long enough, a turkey will come gobbling out. That sounds ridiculous, doesn't it? That's precisely what origin of life researchers have done when they make a protocell. Wait a second. Haven't we been taught with hundreds of millions of years anything is possible? Time is actually the enemy. You let these chemicals that have been made sit around. They show the degradation in a period of weeks. Weeks is the twinkling of an eye when it comes to prebiotic time scales. The chemicals decompose. So to think that the molecules could be made and sit there waiting for other molecules to come in, it doesn't happen. Organic chemistry doesn't work that way. Well, if life didn't spontaneously generate on Earth, what about scientists who believe that life must have come here from outer space? Whether you want to have it originate from Earth or from some other planet, you have to have the origin of life. You have to have the origin of that first cell. How does that happen? We have no idea. So with all the advances in scientific research and the study of life, why can't we figure this out? With all of origin of life research going on, the problem is becoming harder all the time, not easier. 
And the reason it's become harder is because we understand more about the complexity of a cell. To help explain the complexity of living cells, we turn to molecular biologist Douglas Axe. To get an idea of the complexity of a living cell, think of a factory with thousands of pieces of machinery all working together to do some coordinated task. A cell is actually far more complicated than that factory because factories don't maintain themselves. People have to maintain factories, and factories certainly don't make new factories. Whereas with a living cell, all the parts that wear out are automatically remanufactured within the cell. Not only that, the cell is manufacturing a new cell as well. Human-made factories don't even come close. For a living cell to exist and perform such complex tasks, it takes some very detailed instructions, which are chemically encoded in our DNA. If you have a string of nucleic acids like DNA or RNA has, you have to have a precise sequence because that translates to what proteins are needed to build the organism. That's called the information code. But where did all that information, these detailed instructions, come from to build the first cell? We don't have a tool to assess that within chemistry. Laboratory chemistry may not, but Stephen Meyer is convinced origin science does have the tools. Is there anything we know of that does have the causal power, the ability to generate new information, and therefore could explain the origin of the first cell? And I think there is, and that's the, the idea of intelligent design. Intelligent design is defined as the theory that certain features of the natural world are best explained by an intelligent cause, not an undirected process. Because what we know from our experience is that intelligent agents can produce information, and indeed do produce information, in a digital or typographic form, the form of information that we find in the DNA molecule, functional digital information. Whenever we see information and we trace it back to its source, whether we find it in a section of software code or a paragraph in a book or in a hieroglyphic inscription, we always find that a mind played a role in generating that information. Don't be fooled by the hype. Materialists are further from explaining the origin of life than ever before, yet they still refuse to consider the only observable source known to create information code, an intelligent designing mind. We are not materialists. We see the human soul. We experience love. We live with purpose. We fight for justice. We are the quiet majority, and we will be quiet no longer. Mutation, it is the key to our evolution. It has enabled us to evolve from a single-celled organism into the dominant species on the planet, on the planet. The advent of the nuclear age may have accelerated the mutation process. Individuals with extraordinary abilities may already be among us. Mutation is a critical ingredient in the recipe for evolution. Mutation generates variation. Differences between individuals. Individual. Mutation generates variation. Variation. Mutation. Human evolution. Mutation. Human evolution. What's fact and what's fiction here? Are mutations really the key to our evolution? Think about it. In real life, significant genetic mutations don't create superpowers. They create super challenges. Sometimes those mutations are even life-threatening. That's the reality. And yet we're told that random mutations with guidance from natural selection invented and genetically engineered every feature of every living organism. Changes to life's instructions happen more or less at random. Mutation gen generates variation. Evolutionary biologists claim that random mutations accumulating over time ultimately produce life's features. If this is the case, Zillions of chance mutations over the history of life led to the invention of flight and sight, immune systems and reproductive systems, even conscious beings with the capacity to love, reason, create art, and distinguish right from wrong. However, now, we no longer have to rely on speculative claims. Through experiments, we can actually observe mutations and see what they're doing to guide evolution. Biochemist Michael Behe has spent much of his life researching and studying mutations. 
In the past 50 years or so, methods have been developed to track mutations, changes in DNA at the, at the very molecular level. Now we can watch evolution in real time. Since 1988, biologist Richard Lenski has been conducting one of the greatest evolutionary experiments ever done. He started a culture of bacteria called E. coli growing in his lab. And since they reproduce so quickly, now they're up past 60,000 generations. And that's like a million and a half years of human lifetimes. So we are talking about numbers that are big enough to see some serious changes, if serious changes could come about. In his work, he's seen a lot of beneficial mutations come along. But it turns out that the great majority of the mutations were in pre-existing genes, and they either broke or degraded the genes. So the bacteria were evolving, improving more by devolution than by evolution. It's difficult to understand how breaking a gene can be beneficial or helpful. Think of it this way. This way. Suppose you had a, a car, and the most important thing to your survival right now was the gas mileage. What could you do to improve the gas mileage of your car quickly? One thing you could do is rip out the back seat and throw it away. Back seats are helpful, but if your life depended on you getting better gas mileage right now, that would be a beneficial improvement. The problem with that for Darwin's theory is that ripping the back seat out of a car doesn't tell you how you make a back seat. Darwin's theory needs to show that organisms can improve by building things. And that's what has been missing in this terrific experiment. This famous E. coli experiment shows that trillions of random mutations are not capable of building anything new. By the numbers, this E. coli experiment is giant, but it's dwarfed by the size of a natural experiment involving humans infected with malaria. Every year, about a billion or so people contract malaria. So that's a billion times a trillion cells that are made each year on the planet. In recent decades, scientists have exhaustively studied malaria. They've seen how it evolved resistance to several of the drugs used to treat it. But what is more interesting is what scientists haven't seen. There were no new molecular machines, no new genes, and yet it had so many chances, evolutionary theory would have predicted that you'd get something really pretty impressive out of that, but it wasn't seen. And it's not just malaria, it's not just E. coli. The pattern is widespread. For Behe, this raises a serious red flag for evolutionary theory. The discovery that many beneficial mutations are actually destructive or degradatory mutations puts a huge monkey wrench into Darwinian theory. Not only can't Darwin's mechanism of random mutation and natural selection build complex systems, it has a strong tendency to degrade them. This means beneficial mutations. What we have been taught are the building blocks of evolution show no observable capacity to build or invent. We see that overwhelmingly the good mutations come about by breaking old genes. So you're not making something new, you're throwing out something you already had. We see it in bacteria, we see it in mammals, we see it in birds, we see it everywhere, everywhere that's been looked at so far. This scientific evidence completely conflicts with evolutionary theory, and that is why the public never hears about it. Only a few brave scientists have been willing to speak out, like Lynn Margulis. I was taught over and over that the accumulation of random mutations led to evolutionary change, led to new species. I believed it until I looked for evidence. So if mutations aren't the building blocks of evolution, what can explain the invention of new things like the cell, or the eye, or flight? In birds, we find all kinds of amazing interdependent features that appear orchestrated for flight. We know from experience how difficult it is to get a flying machine and what it takes to build one. 
We observe things like purpose and function coming from intelligent sources, not from blind material processes. So when we see design, engineering, and artistry throughout nature, shouldn't we be looking for a designer, an engineer, an artist capable of fashioning what we see? We are not materialists. We see the human soul. We experience love. We live with purpose. We fight for justice. We are the quiet majority, and we will be quiet no longer.